Time now for the nationally syndicated radio show, The World of Lori Zook. And now, here she is, the smart, the sexy, the savvy, Divine Miss C. And welcome to the show. I just love my introduction, thanks to Jeff Collins from WDCF. All right, today... I'm going to do a Masters and Legends show, and I have with me in studio Faye Turk. I want to welcome you to the show, Faye. Thank you, Lori. And now you're a jazz singer and a jazz piano player, and so the best place to start with musicians is always at the beginning. Yes. So talk a little bit about where where are you from? I'm from Tampa. You are? Born and raised. Yes. One of the the natives. We don't hear that very often. Well, tell me about the role of music, you know, in in your family life. Did you come from a musical family? Well, my parents were not musical at all. But they uh, they had there were four of us, four girls, and um, they gave each of us piano lessons. We started out music uh, with piano. And uh, we didn't have piano lessons in the school, and they couldn't afford private at the time. So I took piano lessons in a group at uh, Seminole Heights Recreational Center on Central Avenue, down by Bose Ice Cream. Okay. And uh, after school. <laughs> and, uh, and so I started there. And I'm not sure why, but I didn't go there for very long. And my next, uh, I had piano lessons. I guess may, they may have, have found someone um, with a piano teacher, like yourself. Okay. And I walked to her house on Saturday morning. She lived about 20 blocks from me, and her name was Margaret McAllister. Okay. And um, she taught me classical, you know, how to read, how to play the proper position and, you know, fingering and all of that. Um, and what I loved about Mrs. McAllister is as long as I could do the lesson exactly the way she wanted me to, I could play whatever I wanted. And that was the funnest part of the lesson for me. And that's the after part. Right. Yeah, I got to play whatever I you wanted. wanted to do. That's what everybody <laughs> wants to do. You want to play the music you're interested in, not what the teacher wants you to play. Right. Oh my gosh. Now, your your three sisters did they also continue on with lessons? My sister, two of my sisters did love to play. One of my sisters could play by music really well, but if you took the music away from her, she didn't know what to do. And then my other sister could play by ear, and she lear- she knew the notes, and she could also read chord charts, and she played piano and organ for the church. Oh, wow. Okay, so really a musical family. Now, what's odd is I know, you know, I've heard usually one of the parents, if not both, have that in, in order, but you're saying neither one, or maybe they never tried. They weren't interested. Yeah, I don't my, know. No, I've heard my mom sing. Yeah. No, huh? <laughs> <laughs> she liked to sing, but she was, no. Sorry, no, that's all right. That's all right. Well, hey, you know, did you guys play together as kids, though, on the piano? Because when you have a family where two or more play, a lot of times you get to do duets. Well, you know, um, we grew up in church, and there was a lot of music in church. And my sisters would, would um, play music, like solo, well, in church. And I remember, um, well, when I was little, right, too young, I, and it wasn't that far. Because as soon as I learned to talk, they, were, they, I, they put me on stage. So when I was younger than that, well, I should say I remember the stories because I didn't, I I don't even know that I was was born yet when this happened, but my three sisters, so um, Glenda played the piano and then Sharon and Sarah were singing. And when Glenda played a wrong note, Sarah popped her on the head and said, play it right. <laughs> I guess you learned really fast after that, huh? <laughs> so that was that was our, our music experience was in was in church. Yes. Gotcha. Now, are you the youngest of the four sisters? I am. OK, yes. so you kind of grew up with them already playing piano. Yes. It started before you. Right. So what's your first memory of, you know, of playing? Like, how, did you go to church and they grabbed you and said, hey, you're going to sing now? Well, in our church, um, we had uh, Sunday, Sunday school, you know, so Sunday morning. But before we had Sunday school, we had a general assembly. And during the general assembly, they had a children's choir. And I sang in the children's choir. So that was my, my exposure to music. And then I learned to sing solo. I was so I don't know how I was taught, but I, I learned how to sing a song and all the words. And I sang it as a solo on Sunday nights. And the very first song I remember, it's, uh, it's called, He Washed My Eyes with Tears That I Might See. Okay, so you kind of just kind of grew up in the church and doing in in getting up and it was just a natural, you know. I I I it was it was part of who I was. It was just was a natural. I thought I was just playing 
in front of everybody, you know, just messing around. And in fact, when my mom would take me shopping in the neighborhood, we had a little uh, store in the neighborhood called Penny Saver, and it was a department store. It was like a mini Walmart where it had, it had a shoe department and a cloth department, and you could get drugs. I mean, it was just a, a anyway. So uh, she would take me with her shopping. And, you know, I was only a, like three or four, five years old, and I needed something to do. So she would put me on the stage, which was the shoe department, was up a little ways off right. the floor. And she would set me up on the stage, and I would entertain the sales staff singing their favorite hymns. Oh, would, wow. You know, How Great so Thou you, Art, you know, Amazing yeah. Grace, you know, just all the songs I knew in church. I would just belt them out in for them, and they would sit and listen, you know, just as long as it took. That's pretty amazing because I, I've taught a lot of students over the years, and I've also interviewed a lot, a lot of musicians. The ones, the, the musicians and singers that grew up where it was part of their life from earlier than they can remember, they don't really seem to have any fear of performing, whereas people who tend to learn when they're older develop more of that fear. And I think the difference is when you're brought up thinking that that's the normal thing and everybody does it and that's in your mind, as opposed to someone who starts older and goes, oh my gosh, I have to get up. That would be me in front of all those people because mm-hmm. I didn't start piano until I was eight. I nagged my parents for a couple of years. Until that's when they, I started piano too. Yeah, but you had already that. started singing and yeah. thinking that it was the normal thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about you know growing up because what made you want to become professional at this? Um. I think I always wanted to perform. I always had imaginary audiences in my living room, right? And it was always my dream. And I and I always performed in audiences at church. When I went to college, um, that was my first exposure. When I met other musicians, and you know they were playing professionally, that that kind of opened my eyes that maybe this is something I'd like to do professionally. You know, you could actually get paid to do this. So um, I went to HCC. Uh, I was uh, a a recipient of the first music uh, scholarship. Okay. And I had uh, auditioned for um, the vocal, uh, as a vocal major. And so I I got one of the first. They have a, when I was in high school, I learned about the um, HCC Ybor City Campus opening a performing arts center. Okay. And so I, uh, through my church people and talking about it. And then, so I, I went to school there and, um, they had a band and I went, I, I met some music- musicians and started playing professionally around, uh, around that time. And, uh, got my first exposure to reading chord charts and playing something besides, you know, What's on the paper? What's on the paper and, and scales and <laughs> right, right, yeah, all <laughs> you know, the other in a live stuff. setting, right. So it was um, it was pretty exciting um, and challenging. Um, yeah, because if you haven't done that before and you're sitting down with a group of people, it's not the same as playing solo. There's expectations, right? There's expectations, and all of a sudden you're this wee little person and all these you know big performers that have done this for years and you know nothing all of a sudden and yeah 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 and you just have to kind of jump in and say sink or swim I better make this sound good you know and what's worse I didn't own my own keyboard and the very first keyboard they they loaned me a keyboard and none of the b-flats played oh that that's bad so how do you play how do you play on that I don't you know I was like is this a joke oh no so you couldn't play anything in the key of F because you had no B flats flats. oh my gosh that's uh, I'm not even gonna ask how long ago that was but I mean I remember because I'm older than you I remember the 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 keyboards when they were the toys basically and there was no touch sensitivity and they snapped back really fast Mm -hmm. and believe it or not over the years I have had students that have had the toy keyboards I call them and I tell the parents you know after like three months if your kid is sticking with it You've got to change. And I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, when I first moved to Tampa about 10 years ago, I had friends that lived down here, and I taught the daughter. You know, I gave her piano lessons, and she was on one of these toy keyboards, one of these old toy keyboards. And so it, it was a cost factor for the parents to get something better. But this kid I knew had talent. I knew could play by ear. She would fight on the reading, but she definitely had either high relative or close to perfect pitch. So finally I said, look, I'm gonna, I don't know a lot. I'm not a technician, but I'll tell you how you can test the piano basically. And Kelly has a good ear, so if she, she can listen while you're testing out the keys. Look on Craigslist. You might find one free or cheap. You know, people are in foreclosure. They're dumping their pianos. They lucked out. They found a piano for $150, and it turned out to be a really good piano. The difference between this little girl who at the time she got the piano was probably 15 and had been playing for a few years on a toy and playing on a real piano 
all of a sudden just blo- she just blossomed and went crazy. I mean, she became she was just so naturally talented, but they never would have known that had she not played on that toy. And subsequently, she taught herself how to play the guitar because she knew chords. So that when you're saying that, even though I know you're laughing about it, you ha- had something that really didn't work right, and you had to work with that. And, and make mm-hmm. it work for that. And I, I give you a lot of credit for that because I can't imagine that. <laughs> I can't imagine that one. Well, maybe talk about um, some of your teachers and how they influenced you throughout your life. Well, um, as I said, um, Mrs. McAllister was a great teacher. She was very pre- patient with me. Um, and she taught me, uh, really helped me with my ear. Um, but I didn't really understand that. I mean, one of the, one of the things she used to, I guess, asked me about and I didn't know why she was asking me if I if I thought of a color when I heard a chord and I did but I didn't realize that I was thinking in those colors until she pointed it out to me Mm -hmm. and so that really inspired me that you know wow you know I I, want to explore this more when I got to college at HCC um, I had uh, a class called ear training and um, trying to remember his name now um, and uh, I was I was just our student. I mean, we learned um, do re you know, solfege, solfege, yes, learned, right. And you learned uh, different uh, intervals, and he would give you different songs to work with to help you with those intervals. And I think the hardest interval that I had at the time was um, from the one the tonal to the sharp four. Okay, that was probably the hardest one for me. But all the others was just like I could do this, and. Um, it, but it, it was a really good training, and I, I think back about that training often today even, uh, and trying to learn a song in, with, with strange intervals, like 500 Miles High is a strange one, and, you know, I figured that one out, and, right. and it helps me because I know the, I know the, the intervals, solfege. and of course, knowing yep. the chord charts helps, too. Yeah, yep. and they do solfege in a lot of foreign countries, but we're going we're gonna to take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, we're going to play a song that you sang called It Had to Be You. Okay. Be back in a moment. Central Payment, your number one credit card merchant service provider in the industry. Providing e-commerce solutions, POS systems, standalone terminals, mobile apps, and much more, call Central Payment's James Carner at 813-777-4332. Looking for the lowest rates in the industry and number one customer service? Call Central Payment's James Carner at 813-777-4332. That's James Carner, 813-777-4332. Do you suffer from back, neck, or body pain? Do you suffer from migraines or have jaw or face pain? Has conventional medicine failed you? Were you injured or in an accident? Call chiropractic physician Dr. Dan Maddock at 813-935-1664. Dr. Dan has helped thousands of patients gain relief for more than 30 years. Dr. Dan is caring, gentle, and takes his time with each patient. He's also a past president of the International Craniopathic Society, a special certification of only 300 chiropractors worldwide. Dr. Dan helps patients from the neck up and the neck down. Dr. Dan accepts most insurance plans. Don't continue to live in pain. Call 813-935-1664 today. That's 813-935-1664 and get on track to better health. And welcome back to the world of Lori Zook. My guest today, Faye Turk on the Masters and Legends show. Now, Faye, we were talking about solfege and, and, you know, your ear training do you have perfect pitch? No. I don't have perfect pitch, but I do have relative pitch, meaning that I can hear a chord, and I, if I know that I'm supposed to come in on a certain note, if you play a chord, I'll know I can find my note. Gotcha. And um, even though I've, I do it all the time, pretty regularly without error, I still have a fear that I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to be able to find my note. There is a there's, there's, always that fear. Fear. there's always that fear there. It's well, like, oh, especially when there are can. other people there. Yeah. And uh, this where I really helped myself kind of deal with this fear is um, in the song that you're about to hear. Um, it, it's called it, it Had to Be You. And it was um, we, we played it at the Carol, Carolwood Cultural Center for the Valentine's Day dance. 
and Jim Birch was the director. And we had rehearsed the song. And this, this particular song was difficult for a singer, singer to come in on the right note because the introduction is very fanfare and big and, and, and it's all over the place musically. And you're waiting for one chord and then you're hoping and then and everything stops. Right. And you come in. So you're like in thin air hanging. Okay. So that, that all right by note. itself is, is challenging. Okay. So he didn't realize he gave me even more of a challenge but he, he played a game with the audience. He introduced the song. He told the song. And so he wanted the audience to guess the name of the song. After, but he waited until my first note and stopped. <sighs> so now you're really lost because you got to come in on that note for the rest of the I song. I got to come in on the note with n- nothing. Oh, my gosh. So let's hear it. Okay. It had to be you. That that song is it's all it's low and it's high. You had to hit some notes. That's a tough song, and I don't think people realize for singers, you have to have a certain vocal range really to be successful. And, and clearly, you have that. You can sing the low notes and you can sing the high notes. How do you learn how to do that? Do you, did you take singing lessons also? I did. Um, like I said at HCC, I was a vocal major, and so I did learn to technically sing. Uh, very high. Uh, we spent a lot of time in our in my upper range. I didn't spend much time in my lower range because I was trained as a soprano. That was like where I was, I guess, in those days. So I had to teach myself how to sing in my low range. And um, the closest I can come to describing, because you know it's hard to talk about how 
to sing. Right. Um, the closest I can come to is when you yawn, you open your your vocal area. And so if you and that's what they call singing in your head, that's how you get those high notes. Well, it also works in your nose in your in your low notes by opening your throat. Hmm, and okay. so I had to open my throat to sing the lower notes. I gotcha. Okay. I've, and it's something I actually have to relax to be able to do. To you do. can't, yeah, but when you're trying to sing in your lower range, you know, and really stretch yourself, because you know, we all talk in a certain range. You know, you go, I up, up, and you're just in your speaking tone, or you come down here and you sing in, in, yeah, in like your the, speaking the inflection, voice. The inflection, yeah, the inflection of the voice. And we all have that pitch you know, high and low in our in our speaking voice. But we don't ever purposely go down and sing and speak in a lower tone. It sounds weird. It, right, so it's the same does. thing with singing. You have to make it sound natural, and you can't do that, like, on purpose. You kind of just have to let it go low. Yeah, and, you know, you're bringing a, a, kind of a strange thought to my head, but, you know, people's voices really are music, at least to me. So if somebody calls me up and maybe necessarily they don't necessarily uh, – they leave me a message and they don't say who they are – because usually you can just recognize their voice if it's someone you know. What's also interesting is most musical instruments are the same way, especially pianos, because if you've played on a number of different pianos, they all have their own voice. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I have a piano at home that's almost more of the rinky tink honky tonk you know, old-time jazz style, but you can have dark sounds, you can have bright sounds, tuners tune the pianos differently, and so you must know this, when you go to a, a venue you haven't played, that before and there's already a piano there it's almost like you have to go and touch it before you do that because the feel can be so different it is it is it could be very tight action or it could be very loose there could be notes out of tune and you just got to know where they are and be ready for them right okay now your daughter selena excellent student plays piano really really well so proud of her she showed me a couple of nights ago a, a photo of you i don't know how old you are but you were holding up an award and she told me it was for some type of a piano award so why don't you tell me about that yes i was actually right around her age i was trying to think about that it was right around her age 14 15 and um <clears throat> i had a a district-wide competition in my church so districts so there was a lot of churches that that competed um and i had a, a piano uh, ensemble that I played that I I arranged I guess I took right. uh, several uh, gospel hymns and I arranged a little medley on my own and um, and then I represented my church uh, among a bunch, a bunch of other churches and I came in that was my second place trophy wow there. well she's real proud of you I could tell you for having that picture up I went who's this is this you and she goes no no that's that's mom and I thought that was pretty cool School plays, did you ever you know, Did you ever perform in, did they do school musicals? I'm from the North, so, you know, at junior high school and high school, you've got musicals. Did they do that yes, then? Yes, I did perform in a school musical at, eight, at um, Hillsboro High School. Um, Jerry Scurro was the director at that time. And uh, we did, uh, they, we rehearsed all year, I guess, or maybe the last semester. It was toward the end that we did a, a full a glee style musical performance where we had dancing and singing and acting and all of that and it was a disney theme okay and um it was, it was pretty it was awesome i loved it cool. i still remember some of the songs i sang and that's what, yeah that's how, that's what music does for yeah, you is, yeah it, it's, very... it, it stays with you competitions i know that you took said you took second place were there other competitions because i i always you know felt pressured in any type of competition so when i i do i don't even call it a piano recital i call it a piano concert because when my students play i don't i don't want them to have that fear because some of them are fearful and i understand that i'm i'm one of those that took me years to overcome public speaking let alone public performance is a whole different thing and i know your daughter's nervous about doing it yet i think she's going to do great yeah. because i saw a picture of her playing at a nursing home recently and i understand she was a hit you know so what do you think about that? Well, I think competition is great. Um, like I said, before I went to college, I had never really competed. Uh, I mean, in high school I did, but I mean, it was not the same as when you're competing with people that are older than you and more experienced than you. I mean, when you're competing at, at a peer level, it's different than when you're competing with, you know, anybody. And I think it definitely sharpens your knife, you know, your skill. Yeah. And um, it, it gives you a sense of confidence when you've accomplished it, you know, when you've, when you've really, you've gone through that experience and, you know, you've dealt with the nerves and you sang through or played through the nerves. You know, I may remember putting my foot on um, the pedal and, and having to hold it up 
get it ready and, and that holding up you know my knee was just shaking, shaking like, crazy. <laughs> like, ah. of course I'm not distracted and I'm trying to be natural and it's, uh. it's hard it's the pressure the yeah pressure. but you know it, having the competition at an early age and um, you know I did uh, go to state um, competition through high, the high schools Close, right yeah and so now that was not a competition like a place like you get you win it was a competition really to excel like your school to to get all superiors I think that was the goal was to get all superiors and I got all superiors my chorus got all superiors and we had a sound system um ensemble that got superior so that you know our 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 school was yeah good teachers and and, and good equipment always help well what I want to do I want to we're going to break out for the next segment segment and go to a commercial break but we're going to play one of the big band songs that you sang with I thought that love was just a word they sang about in songs I've heard. It took your kisses to reveal that I was wrong. And love is real. Come to me, bro. Belle et tout pas, je vois la vie en rose. Il me dit des mots d'amour, des mots de tous les jours, et ça me fait quelque chose. Do you miss that old school sound that made radio great? Let me invite you to preview Philharmonic's Jack of All Trades at philharmonicblues.com, a collection of Americana blues available as a download for $7.99. You can sample each track on the album page and try before you buy. Philharmonic, Jack of All Trades at philharmonicblues.com. That's philharmonicblues.com. Central Payment, your number one credit card merchant service provider in the industry. Providing e-commerce solutions, POS systems, standalone terminals, mobile apps, and much more, call Central Payment's James Carner at 813-777-4332. Looking for the lowest rates in the industry and number one customer service? Call Central Payment's James Carner at 813-777-4332. That's James Carner, 813-777-4332. Faye, tell me about the last couple of songs. Well, the first one was um, probably when you, you recognize La Vie en Rose, and um, it's, I sang it in English and in French. Um, that particular version was um, performed by Melissa Manchester, and it was actually the same version that she sang. And that was a challenge um, presented to me by one of the trumpet players in that band, because um, he'd heard me sing in Portuguese and in Spanish, um, and so he was like, you know, I think you would sound really good. You know, and I was like, French? Um, you sound sang- like, on the, on the commercial break, I said, you, it sounds like you speak French because it uh-huh. sounded, the accent was so good. I can't even fake that kind of thing. Well, I was classically trained and we learned to sing in Italian and, right. and we learned to sing in languages. And I, I had to, to learn how, that skill to pronounce, you know, to, the, words. In, the words in order to sing. So I listen to um, all of the French, you know, the uh, this native French and Canadian French. So um, uh, Celine Dion sang it in Canadian French. 
Um, and then there were several French, I don't know who they are, but the French singers that sang it in French. And then some other English pe- speakers, Bette Midler, some other English speaking, sang it in French. So I listened to all of those um, renditions of the song. And then, then I learned to, to read it, read, follow along the words while they were singing. And so I taught myself to, to sing it in French. That's really good. And Dream a Little Dream. I love that song. Yeah, that's, that's my real that's, favorite. Yeah. And what I love about this arrangement, Helen O'Connell, O'Connell specifically arranged this song for the singer. You know, many times in big bands, um, in any real, you, you know, you have to take a break and let the band alternate play, the solos. Alternate, yeah, and they take over and they sing, and then the singer comes back in and finishes it. Well, this song, it's all singer. And yeah, once in a while, I like to be. That's good. You're the star. Me. You're the star. <laughs> it sounded great. Well, let me ask you over the years, how did your personal style of singing evolve or change? Well, I was classically trained, so that was probably the hardest part for me was learning how not to sing so perfectly note, perfectly in time, you know, perfect, perfect all the time. And while the and also the full opera style soprano voice, I, I mean, I never really had that full sound you hear, um, but I had a high and I had to sing, you know, full sound. So in in the style that I'm singing now, you know, you have breathy, you have you take you know, it's more conversational style of singing, and that's some that I learned by listening to the jazz. Because uh, you, you know. sing all different styles, obviously, you you can mm-hmm. pretty much sing anything, right? Right. That's that's really, so you know I listen yeah. to Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan. Sarah Vaughan was probably the the one that I catered to the most because she I loved her style because she had a wonderful ear you know she she did all sorts of things with a song musically that I wanted to emulate gotcha now most musicians have other careers have you had other careers other than being a musician oh yes unfortunately uh, <laughs> the ones that I could not money. do what I love to do for money unfortunately but yeah I had um, careers I started out in um, human resources I did recruiting and um, management consulting um, as my first career and then I had um, when I had my kids, I had to leave the workforce for a little while. And it's kind of hard to get back, especially in human resources, because they're usually, you know, promote from within. Um, hard to get back into that field. Um, but I, 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 I'm really organized and very efficient. So I, I did really well with office management. So I was hired as an office manager. And then now in, at the company that I'm with now, Guy Carpenter, and I've, this was eight years ago. And then I migrated into the position I'm in now just by learning the business and, you know, getting familiar. And so I, I am now in, in a technical assistant role where I help brokers place reinsurance business. Gotcha. I mean, most of the musicians tell me they do it because they love it and it's not about the money because most of them, not all, but most don't make that much money. Well, you know, uh, truthfully, I mean, a true musician, it's not what we do. It's who we are. Good answer. That's probably the best answer I've heard. What have your biggest challenges been as a musician, I mean, can you think of any stories? Did you have to overcome some emergency that came on stage? You know, things like that. Well, actually, recently, um, I was uh, singing at my church uh, for a, a big 60th anniversary, right? And I was on the spotlight was on me. And all of a sudden, right when I got ready to sing, I was playing the piano, accompanying myself. All of the electricity went out and all the, the mic, there was no mic. And so I, you know... It, what else was I to do? So I just continued to play. I played really, really low, uh, you know, re- re- really low, and I sang, you know, I tried really not loud. to sing really. Tried to sing like project my voice without without ruining the sound because if I sing too loud, then it hurts. the tone of my voice is not fun to listen to. It sounds like oh she hurts. she's not you know she sounds like she's in pain. So I had to keep my voice soft enough to sound good and my piano playing was soft enough where you could hear me, and then everybody had to be really, really, really quiet. I got a standing ovation. Oh, that's all. That's that's the best thing. That's the best thing. You have to think quick on your feet. I, I think. I just had to. You know? What am I going to do? No choice. <laughs> I got to perform. That's excellent. What are some of your favorite songs? Um, one of my favorite songs I'm going to sing for you later. In the yeah. Show is uh, Bewitched. Um, I also love Dream a Little Dream of Me. That's one of my favorite songs. Um, what else? Oh, I like uh, I like rhythmic songs. Um, too. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Oh, that's but, all right. I mean, you like the big band. I can hear that. And, I and, definitely like the big you know, band. Yeah, I've interviewed a lot of big band you know, musicians, mm-hmm. and it, it's almost like a, a dying style of music, which is a shame because I think it's the best music ever written, and it swings. And kids nowadays, I don't know what they listen to, but really, 
I, I listen to some of the stuff on the radio. I have to turn it off. There, there's nothing to it. It's candy pop music. It's dance music. There's no style. There's no emotion. There's no class. There's no elegance. Well, I think we've lost the rawness of real music these days with all the electronics and all the recording equipment. I mean, it's great to be able to record, but we lose that rawness of what the, the, the music that touches you in a deep way and relates, you know, I mean, the, the Beatles were so great um, of, you know, their lyrics touched us and all, but they were raw, you know, they didn't have a lot of this pomp and circumstance, all those extra electronic sounds and, and all the stuff that they did to their voice. I mean, they sang out of key. But Not good. We loved them, yeah. but they didn't, they didn't sing perfectly, right. but they sang to your soul, to your heart, and they got to you. That's, to me, what I think we need to help our, our children. That's an interesting – okay, I'm going to go on that. There's an interesting perception there because I've taught kids who, who have come from Asia to this country, and it, it's pretty well known that while the kids are, tend to be very disciplined and very technical, they don't, they're not taught or they don't have the emotions put into the song. So interesting point because when I, when I do teach students, I would rather have them put their heart and soul into the song than have it be you know, 100% technically perfect. And so I guess it, come, it depends on where you come from and who your teacher was. It's a balance, you know, because we don't want to hear someone sing out of tune the whole song, right? I mean, right. That's, that's not pleasant. But at the same time, you want someone to really connect with you through that music. Right. And that connection, that rawness, the little idiosyncrasies of our voices, of our playing even, the, str- the strumming of the guitar, not the actual note, but sometimes when, you're, when you're style. Singer, your, your finger slides, that slide is part of the music. It, right. It's part of the, the, the rawness. And it's what makes you listen to that particular yes. performer when they're playing. Right. And, and so sometimes that's hard to teach. <coughs> Excuse yes. me. Some, some people have it naturally, but when you have to learn to read all the notes in the right hand and read the notes in the left hand and put the timing together, and now I'm going to tell you what a crescendo means and a day crescendo, and you've got to do this and that. And the, you know whether you hit the notes staccato or legato, people go, oh, my gosh, i got to do all that. That's hard, but some people just have it naturally when they put it together in the song, and that's really what you're going for when right. you're doing that big band style. Mm-hmm. Now, do you still practice classical music at all, or you're pretty much I'm pretty much, jazz? yeah. Pretty okay. Much, yeah. Now, tell me a bit about the Jazz Pulse of Tampa Bay. How did you get with them? The Jazz Pulse of Tampa Bay, um, the bass player, Mark Marisowski, contacted me uh, while, while I was on vacation. I guess they were looking for a singer, and he uh, was friends with the, the drummer in the big band that I sing in. And uh, so he passed his name, so he contacted me, and we got together, and we rehearsed, and uh, we just, we chem- chem- chemically, I guess we get along, you know, we have that chemistry, right? and um, we have enough uh, creativity and discipline in the group. He writes most of the music, also Chris Holt, the guitar player, uh, writes the music, and they do have a, quite a lot of um, originals that I'm dying to learn. Um, uh, one of them is uh, one I'd like to play. Um, in the segment, if we can, um, but uh, so we've we've just been together since last October. Gotcha. All right, maybe we can find one of the originals to to play it's called uh, Jazz Juice. suffer from back, neck, or body pain? Do you suffer from migraines or have jaw or face pain? Has conventional medicine failed you? Were you injured or in an accident? 
call chiropractic physician Dr. Dan Maddock at 813-935-1664. Dr. Dan has helped thousands of patients gain relief for more than 30 years. Dr. Dan is caring, gentle, and takes his time with each patient. He's also a past president of the International Craniopathic Society, a special certification of only 300 chiropractors worldwide. Dr. Dan helps patients from the neck up and the neck down. Dr. Dan accepts most insurance plans. Don't continue to live in pain. Call 813-935-1664 today. That's 813-935-1664. And get on track to better health. Do you miss that old school sound that made radio great? Let me invite you to preview Philharmonic's Jack of All Trades at philharmonicblues.com. A collection of Americana Blues available as a download for $7.99. You can sample each track on the album page and try before you buy. Philharmonic, Jack of All Trades at philharmonicblues.com. That's philharmonicblues.com. Early in the evening, right on through the morning dew. And welcome back to the world of Lori Zook. Faye Turk is now going to sing Bewitched live in studio. He's a fool, and don't I know it? But a fool can have his charms. I'm in love, and don't I show it? Like a babe in arms Love's the same old sad sensation Lately I've not slept a wink Since this silly situation Put me on the bleed Wild again, beguiled again, a simpering, whimpering child again, bewitched, bothered, and bewildered. Am I?
that was beautiful. And and I watched you change it to another person while you're singing. Really? Yeah, it's just uh, you just kind of go into your zone when you're doing it. And and I think that's a sign of someone who's professional because there was no distractions. You just you you be, you're in another place when you're singing, and I think that's great. Thank you. Um, what can people expect to see at your performances? Well, we're we're pretty casual and uh, try to be real and connected to the audience. Um, we we do um, small shows, we do big shows, um, and we like uh, jazz style music. Okay, uh, but we like the old standards. Um, that's what you mean. Yeah. Do any of the guys in the band do they sing also, or you're? No, uh, we have a trumpet player, and okay. he sings on that trumpet. Okay. Yep. Okay. That'll, <laughs> that'll that'll keep it working. Now, have you taught students or, or influenced other you know other people musically? I did for a while when I was um, younger. Before I got into um, you know, the, the business world, where I you know when I was in college um, and and out, I did have a few students. Um, I didn't really. I mean, I like sharing that and all, but like you said, you know, not everyone has that natural and so it was a little kind of frustrating for me when I didn't see the progression that I wanted to see I felt like right. maybe somehow I was inadequate as a teacher no that's uh, not you that's usually the kids aren't practicing yeah but. well maybe that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the difference so, is yeah yeah but I did do some vocal people who really like you know in specific purposes so um, people would come to me they want they're going to be doing a performance and they wanted a to coach. get some coaching and so I would I would work with them I'd, I'd you know play help them prepare um, for a performance. That's mm-hmm. good because you have to teach them to get up there and do that whole thing. See, we're kind of opposite each other. I love the teaching aspect and, and watching the students get those aha moments. But I'm not one to get up there and publicly perform. So we're kind of opposite in that respect. You love getting up there, I can tell, to publicly perform. Oh, yeah. Whereas I would be going, oh, my gosh, everybody's looking at me. And like, so, yeah. looking at me. Yay. Yeah, yeah. See, you're, we're the opposite in that respect. I, maybe someday I'll get over that. I, I, I don't know. I used to have to do uh, public speaking, and I would be physically ill before I got up on the stage. Now, fortunately, I'm half blind. I can't see distance. So everybody just is kind of a blur. And since I'm from the North, you hear how fast I speak. <laughs> so, <laughs> somehow I made it work. I don't know. But it took me a long time to overcome that. Now, one of the differences between coming from the North, because I'm from the New York metro area, music in the schools there is a, a big thing. And although they do have cut over the years, you know, the music lower, when I grew up, going back to late 60s, 70s, uh, early 80s, it was pretty big. I mean, most kids did something musical. Nowadays, you know, being here in Florida for many years, most of the kids that I teach piano tell me there's really not a lot of music available. In other words, they, they're they not in band. They they don't do chorus until maybe high school in a lot of cases. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, I, I sit here and go, why is it not considered so important? Because I'm a music and art person. That's my family. And they also cut art out of it. So you're cutting out the the out-of-the-box type thinking for more of the subject academic matter, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So what do you think about that? You know, well, I think um, I think music is definitely good for uh, math skills because in music you're learning patterns and in math you learn patterns. And I think there are a lot of similarities there. And I'm, I'm really sad that the schools don't see it that way. Um, and I think the Common Core has taken away our ability to, to teach from kids' natural abilities. Um, yeah, I don't get Common Core. I've seen how they figure it out, and I go, "That's like, that's like bad jazz. It went way out into left field, and it never came back." So right. I don't really understand the Common Core. It does not make any sense to me. However, you hit the nail on the head when you said the patterns, because if music doesn't have a pattern, it wouldn't sound like a song. And when you recognize the patterns within the music. You know, if you remember, poetry might be the A line, the B line, the A line, the B line. So the two A lines would rhyme and the two B lines would rhyme. Well, that's kind of like that music. It might not always be A, B, A, B, but there's a pattern flowing with that song. And so if you are a trained musician or singer and you can recognize that pattern, it simplifies it so it much. And, it really does. And that's an important thing. So I think it's, it's I Mozart don't know. Mozart was know. great with that. 
You know, yes. Mozart's music is very uh, cyclical, and you can yes. see, predict where it's formatted. Going. Mm-hmm. Right, you mm-hmm. you can see what was going to happen, and it's fun. I mean, you can even sing along if you yeah care to. I do it's... that in the car, but I won't <laughs> sing for you. But I sing to my classical sonatina CD in the car sometimes, and it's it's fun for me. But I love the patterns. Um, what do you love doing other than music? Do you have other hobbies? Yes, actually, I am a, a certified scuba diver. Oh. I do enjoy the water. I mean, grew up in Florida. I was either on or in the water at some point, you know, throughout the year. And um, it was very, very much a part of my life and a part of my family life. We, we spend our vacations every year uh, down in the Keys, and we do um, scuba, snorkel, f- fishing. Uh, we catch lobster. Um, I want to go on vacation with your family. Yeah, I, I used time. to be a scuba diver, and that was amazing if you haven't done it. Oh, that yeah. is, you know, Except when you see the sharks far away or, or the barracuda surrounding you. But, hey, hey. it was definitely – that. that's cool. Um, what advice would you give to prospective singers and musicians that are looking to turn professional? I would say um, (laughs) don't do it. A lot of them say don't do it. Make sure you have a good financial base. A backup plan. Backup plan. You know, that you you go to college, you get a degree, or you get a good crap that you're going to have a very solid uh, financial back. Because it is very, very difficult to make a living doing music as a professional, you know, unless you're... You, right. you get discovered, you know, American Idol or something. But um, to just, you know, say, okay, I'm going to be a professional musician or I'm going to be a, a recording artist, it just doesn't happen out of the blue. You have to make it happen, and you have to be able to support yourself in the process. Yeah, I, I've had a lot of former students go go on to lives either as music teachers, piano teachers, or performers, but most of them do have the degree in something else or as a double major so mm-hmm. that they have something to fall back on, but they all really love music, and I think that's a very important kind of thing. Um you said you perform pretty much at various venues. So it's it's um, the name of the band again? The Jazz Pulse of Tampa Bay. Okay. And now, how can people book you? Is there a website, a Facebook? What contact information well, do you have? Well, jazzpulse.com is our website, and we are on Facebook. Um, so that's one way. You can also send an email to me, Turk at gmail.com is my Gmail address. Um Okay. So send me an email or you can book, book us um, online. Good. I want to thank you very much for joining me today. And I think we're going to go out with one more song. Hi, this is John Austin, host of the Book Club on the Tan Talk Radio Network. I spent 35 years in publishing, and today I want to tell you about a book that could change your life. The book is No Cash, No Problem. The author is Dave Wagenford. Dave Wagenford is one of the greatest barter experts in the world. He's bartered over $500 million in goods and services. If you want to remodel your home, but the cost is just too high, or maybe there's an automobile that you have dreamed of owning, but thought you just couldn't afford, well, this book will allow you to do both of those things, plus hundreds more with little or no cash. Maybe you're a business owner with a cash flow problem that leads to low or non-existing profits. Read this book and see how you can increase your cash flow and your profits by time-proven techniques. The book, again, is No Cash, No Problem, and you can buy it now online at www.tantalknetwork.com. Click on the book and follow the instructions, or pick up the phone and call Lola at 727-441-3311. The book costs only $6.99, so do yourself a favor and buy the book today.